We've all heard the phrase, awareness is the first step. In this episode, I'll explore the art of noticing and how it's not as simple as it seems. So here we go, episode 104, Noticing. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Noticing things is important. I think we can all agree on that. And in order to be the best for our horses, we have to notice small changes in our horse's balance or emotional state or posture or weight or behavior or, 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 or. The list could go on. And the more you understand something, the more you'll notice. And the more you notice things, the more you'll understand it. But noticing is hard. And I think it's important to realize just how hard it is to notice things. We as humans can't pay attention to everything, or our brains would be easily overwhelmed. So in fact, apparently, and now I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm going to kind of stick my toes in those waters on this episode. So for all the real neuroscientists out there, bear with me doing my best. (laughs) But in reality, our brain can only really focus on one task at a time. So apparently, if you attempt to multitask, the brain power is then split. So you're doing each thing less well. Now I know some of you are thinking, but I can really multitask. Because there's always someone who's like, no, no, but I can multitask. <laughs> well, I guess what I've, what I've read is that you can do multiple things at once, but you're, you're likely actually alternating between things and not actually focusing on both things at once. So everything I've read about studies on this concludes that true multitasking, doing more than one task at a time is is more of a myth. And people who think that they can split their attention between multiple tasks, um, doing multiple tasks at once, aren't actually getting more done. In fact, they're doing less and getting more stressed out and performing worse than those who single, ta- who single task. So what's really happening is there's context shifting. So you're sort of bouncing from one thing to the other thing, one thing to the other thing. And from what I understand, when you shift to a different task, your brain has to kind of stop doing the thing over here, (laughs) stop paying attention to that whole thing. And then it has to like close that folder and open up a different folder when you do the other task. And each time you close the folder, open the other folder, it takes time and it takes energy. So you're basically, when you're trying to multitask, you're basically repetitively distracting yourself (laughs) from each thing that you're trying to do. So if you might be really good at driving and really good at texting, but you're not going to be as good at texting when you're driving, and you're definitely not going to be good at as, as good at driving when you're texting. And there's all kinds of studies that you can Google and look up about this. So don't take my word for it. But it's pretty clear that it's not advisable, even though many people will truly believe that they are the exception and they're definitely able to multitask. Now, the brain will intentionally filter out information that it doesn't think is important for whatever the task at hand is. And this is really cool. So focus is actually not created so much by like shining a spotlight, but that focus is created by tuning out everything else. So, I mean, this is good. And it's why 
you can train yourself to focus on what you need to. You know, for example, if you're nervous about a performance, you can tell your brain to focus on something related to the task at hand instead of all those voices that are going other places. So you can learn how to tune those out and leave yourself focusing on the task at hand. (laughs) I'm sure all the neuroscientists are cringing. I'm sorry. (laughs) Anyway, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because I... I thought about this art of noticing and, and how, you know, how many layers there are and how many different things there are to notice about our horses and really about everything. So that's what got me going down this road. I thought, well, let me, let me just poke around at this noticing thing. So I promise I'm, I'm going to relate it back to horses because, you know, why else would we want to notice things or what else would we want to notice things about (laughs) horses anyway? So in order for us humans to get stuff done, we have to not notice and not pay attention to lots of stuff. So we're actually getting a lot more practice blocking stuff out and not noticing than we are of actually noticing stuff. And there's this term, this thing called inattentional blindness. And inattentional blindness occurs when someone, when, when one fails to notice a readily visible yet unexpected visual stimulus in one's sight. Simons and Chabri, 1999. (laughs) So this is really cool. So, um, it's a temporary unawareness and it's usually going to come up when there's what they call an abundance of visual stimuli meriting one's notice. So in other words, we're so busy paying attention to some things that we have to block out others. And there's some really cool videos on this. There's several that I came across. There's a classic one that you can Google. Um, You can find if you Google inattentional blindness, how many passes. So I don't want to spoil it for you who haven't seen it. I highly recommend going and taking a look because it's kind of interesting. Uh, But it's testing your ability to pay attention and we'll uh, show you something about that. So then I came across another way that we humans are good at not noticing. And that's when we're really practiced at something. So the more practiced we are at something, the less we have to think about it consciously. This is not, it's a good thing, right? So this is like driving. We don't have to think about it so much. We can almost go into, you know, autopilot or a trance. It's like a mini trance. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this. You know, you're driving, you arrive home, and then you realize that you can't even remember like the last 10 miles. And When we do things the same way, often, it's really easy to go into this automatic pilot. So in this state, we're definitely conscious, but we're not fully aware. So, you know, you don't even have to text and drive. You just go in a little trance when you're driving and you'll stop noticing things. And remember, noticing things actually is important. So, Going to that trance when you're driving is very, very common, but it's, it's still not advisable. Right? It's a little too, too little noticing. And there's been studies and, you know, yes, you're conscious. Yes, you're seeing the road. Yes, you're driving, but reaction times go down. So where are we? Where are we now? Where are we now is awareness is important. Noticing what's going on in the present moment is important. We want to be able to notice as much as we can with our horses. But we can only pay attention to one thing at a time. Multitasking or trying to pay attention to more than one thing at a time decreases the quality of performance. But (laughs) we also learn that if we hyper-focus on one thing, then we're actually going to miss out on other important information. That's that inattentive blindness. But when we're so good at something that we don't have to hyper-focus on it, well, then we go into a trance (laughs) and, and we don't notice things 
you know, we, we not notice things also there. So like, geez, <laughs> that's a lot of not noticing that's set up in our brains. So I guess the key is to practice being able to focus on one thing at a time until it gets to be second nature, like driving, while finding a way to keep ourselves alert and engaged so that we don't go into a trance. And then we need to consciously, actively make a point to scan the environment for possible unexpected things. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be blocking everything out, <laughs> going inattentively blind and in a trance. So no wonder we might miss stuff. All right, so let me just repeat what we need to be doing. Okay, let's see. We need to practice being able to focus on one thing at a time until it gets to be second nature, like driving, while we're finding a way to keep ourselves alert and engaged so we don't go into the trance when it becomes second nature. Then we need to actively make a point to scan the environment for possible unexpected things. Okay, that's not all. <laughs> There's another but. All right, but there's another thing called confirmation bias. Oh man, confirmation bias is the tendency to notice, search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or supports our prior experience. Oh boy. <laughs> oh. So we're trying to do all this noticing, and even when we notice, we're only going to notice the things that confirm or support our own existing beliefs. So it reminds me of this quote, which I couldn't find a, a credit for, but the quote is, we only know what we see, and we only see what's already in the mind. So <laughs> if the ability to notice things and not just the things we want to see, how, how can we learn to be more objectively observant? How can we do that? How can we learn to be objectively observant if, the, the ability, if we're mostly not noticing things and the things that we do notice are just the things that we want to already see? So I Googled some more stuff. And I'll share some of the things that I saw come up the most of how to do this, of how to notice things and not just see the things that we already want to see. So one of the things was to regular, regularly look at things from a different angle. So I love this. When I do... Um, live event. So I do a live event um, for professionals back back when we did it in person. Um, one of the things that I would tempt people to do is every time you take a break and you come back from the break, sit in a different place, sit in a different seat. And it's amazing how uh, strong the, the, the pull is to sit in the exact same place every time. So if this was a two-day event, each day had a morning and afternoon session. Um, often, whatever seat someone sat in on the morning of the first day, that was their seat. But I would tempt them to change it because literally just physically looking at something from a different angle will help you notice things differently and it will keep you more engaged. So with your horse, this could be you know, how can you look at your horse from a different angle? You could video yourself. So instead of getting the rider's eye view, you can get the video view. You know, or if you're um, playing with your horse online and you want to observe them, uh, have a friend 
<laughs> you know, you're always looking from the middle of the circle, have a friend play with them online or have them circle. So this is a great thing if you're looking, for, um, if your horse has some soundness issues and you're trying to figure them out, you know, I'll look at them as I'm playing with them online, but then I'll have somebody else do it so I can stand outside. And I learned a while ago when I'm, when I'm teaching that I actually teach differently. I have different ideas and I have a different, literally, perspective when I'm standing um, in the middle of the circle they're making around me or if I'm inside the arena but they're, they're circling um, in front of me. And then it's different still if I literally just step outside the arena. And each time I change that location, I'm seeing things from a different angle and I'm literally teaching differently. So it's a, it's a good thing to notice and then utilize that. So I know when I get tired, I need to take myself out of the arena because I see more and I scan more. If I can get too hyper-focused on one person and then I miss some other stuff. All right, so a different strategy for being able to see things um, objectively, get closer to seeing and noticing what's actually happening without all this inattentive blindness and trances and confirmation biases is to um, walk at a different speed and take a different route. We all have our well-worn paths. So I have, you know, it, I've got the system. And when you're efficient people, like horse people can get really efficient, right? Because we got to like be super efficient so we have more time for our horses. It's so easy to like, you step out the same door, you walk in the same path, you take the same route. So tempt yourself to take a different route. Whether that's driving or just walking out to the barn. You know, I can always go in the same way, same end of the barn. And I do try to mix things up. I'm like, well, let me walk this way. Let me walk around that direction. Walk in from the other side of the barn. You'll see things differently. You'll notice new things. And strangely enough, the, the speed makes a big difference too. So I tend to be a really fast walker, uh, but I remind myself to walk more slowly and excruciatingly slowly sometimes. And then sometimes I'll do, I'll get into like a speed walking thing. <laughs> anyway, change it up. So another thing you can do uh, is to make a point to use different senses. So this is something I've noticed um, with myself that I get different ideas when I'm out um, dragging the arena. So that, that's been, um, you know, the, the tractor has always been a, a nice idea maker for me. And I usually get different kinds of ideas when I'm dragging on the tractor. And so there's a lot of different reasons why that might be. It might be all the white noise, or maybe it's more than white noise, but the, the diesel tractor noise. It could be the repetitive, repetitiveness of dragging the arena. But I think what I'm noticing is I think it's the earplugs. So I've noticed that, you know, sometimes I'll put the earplugs in right as I start up the tractor, but sometimes like if I grab the earplugs in the, in my house, I'll stick them in my ears. If I know I'm heading right out to the tractor, I put the earplugs in and I've noticed that I think differently when my earplugs are in. And when I'm thinking differently, I'm seeing differently and I'm seeing different things. So I think that's an interesting idea about changing you know, you make a point to use different senses, earplugs I can't hear, and I start thinking and seeing differently. So that might be an interesting thing to play with. Um, and I'm not sure I recommend blindfolding yourself while you go play with your horse. Um, but maybe there's times you can sit with your horse and close your eyes and listen, or just smell your horse, you know, smell things differently. I don't know. Just an idea. So another, another point that I found recommended to help notice or to help bring that awareness and to really be seeing and not just, you know, your brain turning off 
the, the normal things that it teaches itself not to pay attention to is to um, listen to other people or do what they do. Well, you're listening to me, so yay. <laughs> Hopefully that will help you notice more things. But the do what they do is an interesting one. And um, that was one of the exercises uh, when I was uh, studying with Don Miguel Ruiz with the Toltec stuff. And he, they had an exercise called not doing. And basically the not doing was just not doing stuff you normally do. And it's hard to think of ideas of stuff you don't normally do because it's like, you know, <laughs> it's your idea. You do your own ideas and you've been doing them. So what he would say is just if you're in line or if you're ordering something at a coffee shop or deli or something, just order whatever the person in front of you orders, you know, unless you're allergic, but just do what other people are doing. Watch them and, and do it. And it's just a way to, to, again, shift your perspective, do something different, break a pattern, you know, and to listen to other people, you know, listen and learn. A lot of times I know, you know, when we're in conversation, so many conversations are sort of trading stories back and forth. And, you know, while you're listening to one person, you're just busy trying to think of like, well, what's the story I'm going to tell when they stop talking? And, and everybody's sort of in their own heads thinking about what they're about to say instead of really listening. So if you feel like you want to start increasing your awareness and noticing more, that is a strategy that I saw come up a number of times is just to listen, listen to other people, hear what they have to say and do what they do. So another recommendation was to make a conscious game to pay attention to seeing things of a certain color or to pay attention to the a certain shape. So I, I thought this one was really interesting. So you could just go, you know, I'm going to notice pink things today. I mean, like from if I from my house to my barn, if you were to ask me right now, like how many pink things are there? I'd probably say, well, I can think of one flower that's growing, that's pinkish, but there's nothing else pink between here and my barn. But I just, I played this game and you know what? There were lots of pink things because I saw some pink in the lichen that was growing on one of the fence boards. And I saw um, some red that had faded to pink and I saw, you know, pink on a bug and I saw pink on a rock and I started seeing all kinds of pink that I never would have noticed before. And so you can do that with color or you could do it with a shape. You could pay attention to the shape of leaves. Like I wonder how many oval leaves there are. Or I wonder how many leaves there are with, I don't know the term, but it's not an oval, but there's like things that stick out, <laughs> whatever that is, or like, how many leaves are variegated, you know? So you could just, before you even leave the house, kind of make a commitment. So you're going to notice how, you know, you're going to notice which side people part their hair. Just pick something and practice paying attention to it. So when it comes to noticing, there's, there's a game that I, I actually do play <laughs> with myself. It comes in really handy when you're waiting for something or someone. And if I'm standing somewhere or sitting somewhere, I kind of define an area. So I might just define something like one square foot. And I just kind of, okay, there's the area. Don't make it too big. And then I say, all right, I'm going to notice three things. And I, if I can, I say them out loud. I like to say things out loud. Um, you can still say them out loud and people can't hear them. So if you're around people, there's there's a way that you can say them out loud, but inside your mouth. <laughs> anyway, so I'll notice three things, say them out loud. And then I notice three more things. I say them aloud. And then when I'm done noticing those things, I say, well, three more. And so I just keep going. Three more things, three more things, three more things. And what's really cool is often I get to a place at some point where I think, there's nothing left to notice. 
nothing, done. I've noticed all the things. And then you just say, what's three more? And so you'll get to a little sticky point. Well, I get to a little sticky point. And then it's like the gates open up. Like, oh, there's three more. Because I, I found a different sort of thing to notice. So you get past the normal things that you notice. And you get into things that you're not used to noticing. A whole different criteria, a whole different category of stuff to notice. Oh, I didn't think about the, the texture. I didn't think about the shadows. I wasn't noticing those, whatever it is. You can notice the white space in between the things or the empty space, the negative space. So three more things, three more things, three more things. And if you think you've noticed everything, then what's another thing you can do? Get up, look at it from a different angle. And it's amazing what you'll notice just by looking at it from a different angle. And so, of course, this is a really great game to play with your horse. Look at his legs. Notice, take just one leg and play this game. Three things, three things, three things. Practice noticing and then noticing more and then noticing more until you think there's nothing left to notice. And that's when the game really begins. Keep noticing. Now, if you're like me, you want to know and understand your horse as much as possible. You want to see the early signs of pain or fear or illness. And you want to notice the subtle changes in balance and movement. And you want to really know your horse. But as we saw today in this episode, we're fighting our brain. <laughs> our brain is trying to find the easiest way through life and to find patterns it can return to and is trying to block out as much stuff as possible. So I hope that maybe by knowing this and practicing the art of conscious noticing, we can be better for our horses. 